Are you sick of government lackeys who say you didn't build that? Are you tired of elitists who think you need a government permission slip for everything? Everything you do is an A to B conversation and the government should see their way out of it. Create true free markets by adopting the BIPCOT No Government License. The BIPCOT NoGov license allows user modification of any product, service, or software except by governments or government agents. Go to BIPCOT.org. That's Bravo, India, Papa, Charlie, Oscar, Tango.org. Hello, everybody, and thank you for listening to this episode of The Peaceful Podcast. I'm Jessica Pavoni, and today we have a special guest, our very first non-military or non-military affiliated guest, Danilo Cuellar. He's a uh, fellow parent of two, fellow anarchist volunteerist, and a peaceful parent of two. Uh, I believe we first met maybe through the Tom Woods show. I honestly can't even remember by now, but Danilo, thank you so much for coming on, and uh, it's a pleasure to have you. No problem. Yeah, I heard about you first through the Tom Woods show, and I'm, and and after that, I'm like, I put you down as a possible guest. I'm like, I gotta contact these people, but it's, but it was a wh- a while before I actually did. I think you commented under one of my posts, and I'm like, you're the same. Aren't you the same person? <laughs> yeah. So the internet's good for helping find your tribe. <laughs> yeah. So uh, thank you for that. See, you uh, you encouraged me. You you know. You know, lit, lit the fire under my butt. You're like, all right, get this going. Come on. <laughs> no, it, it, it's a good thing. So uh, I'm honored to to have you on our little podcast today. And um, we're going to discuss something a little bit different, although it's uh, definitely tied to uh, peace and justice and caring for uh, others and whatnot. But uh, instead of talking about conscientious objection and, and avoiding warfare and reasons to leave it, I want to discuss a philosophy that ultimately led me to, to leave the military, and that would be volunteerism and following the non-aggression principle, which um, you would understand very well. So before we get started, I was hoping you could give our listeners just a little bit of a personal background and, and tell us, uh, who is Danilo and why do you have something important to say to us? <laughs> yeah, I hope I have something important to say. <laughs> got a podcast. But um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I grew up... Um, as uh, not really interested in politics, my my mother was more my my my, my mother's family is more Democrat, um, uh, left leaning, and so um, you know they would vote for every Democrat. But I didn't really care. Um, and uh, growing growing up in high school, you know, I I learned a lot of stuff. Uh, the most valuable things I learned in high school were outside of government school, right? Um, you know, all these books, you know, chess and piano and physics, theoretical physics and cosmology and astronomy and philosophy, Eastern Western philosophy and alternative medicine, which led me down the path of of Chinese medicine with acupuncture and Chinese herbs and uh, Eastern nutrition and massage. And, uh, and then, you know, that I started looking more into nutrition and, and alternative, uh, uh, nutrition, uh, nutritional therapies, including like Gerson therapy and alternative cancer therapies and then, and then Monsanto and then vaccines and GMOs. And then, you know, <laughs> and so, yeah, so it, it led me along. So I, I entered this through the nutritional path, um, and, uh, and so I was interested in that and, and then in Monsanto a big one. Right. And so, you know, everybody hates a Monsanto, I guess rightfully so, but, but, uh, you know, and then I began to realize like, like, wait a minute. So all these corporations are pretty bad, but how do they have all this power? Right. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, there's a common thread to them, right. In that all of them, uh, appeal to sovereign immunity, by the state, right? They are all protected by legislation, by regulation, you know, by all the barriers to entry that destroy their competition, you know? So, so when people advocate for more regulation, more laws, you know, tax the rich, tax these corporations, you know, they're like, bring it on. I love it. Give it to me because I can take it, but my competitors can't take it. And, and, you know, people have a, it's kind of confused, you know, the Occupy Wall Street people and the Bernie Sanders people and all that. Um, so I didn't realize that until later, until I started studying more about, um, you know, government, the nature of politics. And um, and I first got into, like, a uh, creature from Jekyll Island, Edward, G. Edward Griffin. It's a good and, book. Oh, awesome book. Yeah. I remember... Uh, you know, it's funny when you, when you first learn about this stuff, I don't know if you went through this, but, um, I got so excited and I was calling up my cousin, my, my, my mother. And I was like, you gotta see what is in this book. This is so awesome. <laughs> you know, there's four, there's four stages of money. It's commodity. It's, um, what is it? It's, it's, it's receipt. It's fractional. And then it's fiat. And then, and, and then there's, and then there's central banking and then the federal reserve and it's all crap. And it started in 1913. <laughs> 
<laughs> and I was so excited to tell my mother, you know, and, and everybody's like, whoa, whoa, slow down, slow down. You're talking crazy now. <laughs> What got into Danilo? <laughs> I know, I know. And uh, I remember my 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 cousin uh, who didn't really care about that stuff, and he's like, he's like, Danilo, it's it's all right, all right, calm down. <laughs> um, so that's the initial, uh, you know, excited, uh, you know, with this new information phase. And then I started reading more Larkin Rose, and uh, and then um, also about unschooling, uh, like uh, Alfie Cohn, um, unconditional parenting. I think that is. Um, a little bit of the continuum concept. Um, sure. What's her name? Jean Lidloff, I think. Um, yeah. So and then uh, yeah, and then and then Larkin Rose, and then uh, you know there's other ones like the uh, uh, Morris and Linda Tannehill. Um, yes. Oh, what's it called? Um, uh, Market for Liberty. Market for Liberty. I read that like twice, which is very rare for me. It's rarely. Straight and short. Yeah, it's so powerful, so so detailed and packed, and it's just a yeah amazing read. And it's amazing that it was written like in 1970s. And uh, it's pretty, it's pretty um, <clears throat> relevant even today, <clears throat> you know, because information is timeless. Um, but yeah, so so that's what really got me uh, thinking about all this stuff. And and so my my in was not only the nutritional aspect, but also economics and um, sure. precious metals and uh, central banking and Federal Reserve. Right, that's what really fascinating me. Like the history of precious metals. Why was precious metals so dominant in history? You know, why the central banks? Why why were they so threatened? And governments too. Why are they so threatened by precious metals? Right, um, <clears throat> because uh, because they are they are a restraint. You know, on uh, on the state. You that's know, a good word for it. say again. That's a good word for it. Things you don't learn in school. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So, so precious metals. And so, I remember when I was in my um, acupuncture clinic, and uh, <laughs> I would assess the patients. You know, see, see. You know, ask them some certain questions. See if they're like open to this information. And then I would go into my, uh, and then I would close the door, and I would just like <laughs> sit down with the patient. I'm like, all right. And I took out a dollar bill, and I, and I explained how much you can learn just from a dollar bill, <clears throat> like. Um, you know, over the top, it says Federal Reserve note. What does that mean, right? Because everybody calls this a dollar bill, right? But what is historically a dollar, right? A dollar, um, you know, according to the Constitution, uh, if you, you know, go by that, it's like a certain amount of grains of, of gold and silver, right? Yep. And, then, and then later on, it was more specific, like one dollar became a receipt for gold, right? $20, uh, you know, one gold ounce, one ounce of gold was tw was equal to twenty dollars. Right, one twentieth an ounce of gold is one dollar, and then that that just degenerated as the Federal Reserve was printing, printing, printing. It became one <clears throat> one ounce sure. for every fifty dollars, and then it's and just, now you're fractionated, and and now it's just nothing. <laughs> so yeah, yep. so it was worth. It, it 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 was it could be exchanged for gold. Like you could take a twenty dollar bill, go to the bank, and say, "Give me my gold." You could do that, and nobody knows that, <clears throat> right? And that's what I that's what you're telling me. I'm like, can you imagine taking this money and going to the bank and you can get gold? Like everyone's like, "What?" Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so I just love teaching people about economics because um and about and about monetary system because um not many people know about it and and I really um I think what uh, Henry Ford said was so true that. Uh, you know, if if the people knew how the monetary system works, uh, there would be a revolution before tomorrow, yeah. right? Yeah, <laughs> that was a really apt quote. <laughs> oh, I love that. Yeah, <clears throat> um, and so I try. That's that's one thing that I try. I like to tell people because I find that there are certain topics with people that are very hot and contentious right like immigration like everybody's got an opinion on immigration taxes most people have opinion on taxes um you know what else maybe the school system a lot of people have opinion on that maybe foreign policy a lot of people have opinion on terrorists get the terror you know all this kind of stuff but who cares who cares about fiscal policy in the monetary system nobody knows nobody cares <laughs> it's so boring <laughs> yeah meanwhile you're getting robbed every single day and yeah. uh, and and Janet Yellen comes on TV and she's like, "Don't worry, we're we're our focus is for two percent inflation per year. We're gonna meet that goal." And everyone's like, "Yay!" Yeah. <laughs> it's it's a little insane, you know. I was surprised after I read Creature from Jekyll Island how little that I actually knew, and I never cared about that stuff until my husband got me into it, and he read Jekyll Island first, and was like, "Oh my gosh!" <laughs> yeah. When we first talked about fractionated banking it was yeah. like well that doesn't make much sense 
<laughs> you dig a little deeper and you find we've been getting fleeced for so long. Yeah, yeah. And the, the idea that banks, um, I mean, the Federal Reserve can create money out of thin air or create currency out of thin air. That's the other, that's the other thing I like to dis- <laughs> distinguish is the difference between currency and money. And uh, I don't know if you read Mike Maloney's book. Um, um, it's called uh, so. Rich Dad's Guide to Investing in Precious Metals. I haven't read that one. Oh, such an awesome book. Um, yeah, really great. Um, and yeah, he goes into specifics about, yeah, what's the difference between currency and money? And he also made a, a great um, mini documentary series uh, called The Hidden Secrets of Money. Um, and he made like six episodes so far. Each episode is like half hour. Awesome, awesome. Very educational. Well, so un- unpack that in a couple of sentences, currency versus money. For so, anybody okay, so, so, um, so basically currency has uh, how many um, i forget how many attributes it's like it's like it's a medium of exchange it's a unit of account it's portable durable um fungible, fungible which means it's interchangeable a dollar in my pocket by the same as a dollar in your pocket um and uh and divisible right those those characteristics medium of exchange unit of account and all the other ones uh that's currency that's every single fiat currency on the planet has those has those characteristics um <clears throat> there has been um, countless currencies in the past um, that have fit that category, like tobacco, like lumber, like nails, copper, sugar, salt, spices. Pelts. Say again? <laughs> Animal pelts. <laughs> Animal pelts, beads, bird feathers, uh, cigarettes, stamps, candy in prison. <laughs> you know, so many different things. I mean, it can act as a currency. Yeah, even, even, even uh, um, animal, uh, what do you call it, uh, shells from the ocean. Right, and so for whatever reason, um, they were most of them were abandoned, right? Uh, because they didn't fit those common characteristics of currency. Um, like let's say, let's say for shells, right? So uh, a a, uh, um, a tribe that lived near the ocean, it wouldn't make sense for them to use shells, right? Because you know they're using shells, and and then you're saving in shells, and then you got a big wave, a tsunami brings all you know shells from the ocean, and your your savings of shells are worthless, right? <laughs> Got hyper, hyper, hyperinflation. Im, Im, immediate <laughs> hyperinflation, right? So yeah, so it really matters the proximity of you know where you're living. It depends on what currency they're using, and uh, and so yeah, so they came and went, uh, and and it turned out that uh, you know through free trade, people just trading and and choosing you know merchants and businessmen choosing what is the most um, effective medium of exchange. Sure. Gold and silver just rose to the top naturally, right? Yep. It's just it doesn't it doesn't rot, doesn't putrefy, doesn't go bad. It can be you know stored for very long periods of time. You know resists rust, resists you know so many things. So it can't be it there's can't, a limited supply of it. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Very. Oh scarcity. That's another thing. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. It can't be destroyed. Um, so so and, and I was thinking actually because not even if you think about it not even gold and silver is perfect right it's so far it's the best but but if, can, can you okay let me ask you this uh, uh, let me let me give you a little little uh, little test question uh, can you think of a situation where gold and silver would not work like w- w- would be devalued like quickly. Uh-huh. Um, I guess if they ever figured out how to manufacture it would be one, which okay. has, you know, has been tried many times. Right, right. right. The, um, when you say it couldn't work, I think of, hey, my gold is in uh, Colorado and I happen to be in California when, you know, all hell breaks loose. <laughs> okay. All right. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's what that's the one downside is it's. Fit- but I'm not answering your question. So what's the. Uh- <laughs> so, well, well, one one possibility I thought of was what if an asteroid hits earth from space that's loaded with gold and silver sure that would change things immediate hi- <laughs> immediate hyperinflation right there right yeah so everybody's everybody's uh you know value would go down of their savings <laughs> right so so yeah so not so what i'm saying is not even gold and silver is immune to these market forces right so it's just sure. to say that so far it's the best um oh yeah sure. okay okay so 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 those things were currency right so now the difference with currency and money the very special attribute that makes something money is increases value over time is a store of value over time right which currencies are not <laughs> at mm. all you know fiat currencies or even those other currencies um you know sugar you know uh deteriorates um you know uh what like spices yeah it's just sure. like they're not good over long periods of time it's very difficult either they can't be divisible they can't be portable you know they're not durable they they break down whatever for whatever reason uh so so they have to satisfy all those attributes plus be a stores of value and uh, and 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 gold and silver really ha- has risen to the top so 
Um, so yeah, so I taught my uh, my son. Uh, he's now going to be six in, in like ne- in, by next week, and uh, and I've and I've been I've brought him to the uh, Golden Silver Shop when I go shopping, <laughs> and so and it's fun for him, you know, because I you know he gets to play with the the, the coins and and he loves it. He loves counting them, and yeah. and I and I show him the ding test. You know, you got to to figure out if it's counterfeit or not. <laughs> Uh, that's pretty neat. It's good for him too, though. I think uh, Simon Black and Peter Schiff were kind of uh, the two people that inspired us to get gold. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so um, yeah, I got. So I got... you teach your patients this sort of stuff. How does that go over? Well, I do it in secret uh, <laughs> because <laughs> I don't think my boss would would not, well, he wouldn't want me want uh, having you know he wouldn't want me having such. Um, uh, how do you say uh, controversial controversial conversations with the patients <laughs> sure. but uh, but that's why I, I determine I assess these people you know I don't do it to everybody because well, some people get offended or I don't know they're bored or whatever but there are some people that are really really interested they're like wow I didn't think of it like that you know um, or I mean you could even continue like with the dollar bill like why does it have a serial number why is it signed by the US Treasury if it's part of the Federal Reserve, the Federal Reserve made it, but the U.S. Treasury signed it, right? Why is that? Um, and then, and then I like to tell them that um, one dollar, um, you know, the paper, the ink, uh, and then transported and and um, and stored costs roughly six cents, right? For one dollar, <laughs> that's what I tell them. Now, how much do you think it it costs them to print? Uh, you know, with the ink and the paper, and the paper, and then transport and store a hundred dollar bill. What, what would you say? Six cents. <laughs> no, seven cents because you got an extra zero, right? You need a little bit more ink, right? <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> and, and, and then I tell them, I tell them that they're like, their eyes like, like what? <laughs> like in shock. Like that's what I'm killing myself for? Is this paper with ink? Um, and so. It's really, uh, it's really important to realize how, how much of a scam the whole thing is, and that's one. Uh, there's one episode. Um, uh, Mike Maloney does it's episode four, which is the uh, I think it's the biggest scam of all time. Which he basically talks about money creation. How does how does money creation actually happen at the Federal Reserve? And and in the words of uh, there's a book I think it's called Modern Money Mechanics that's written by uh, one of the Federal Reserve branches, like the Boston Federal Reserve branch, in the like the 1960s. And mm-hmm. and there's a quote which says, if a private citizen writes a check there has to be funds in the bank to withdraw the money uh Mm -hmm. for that check to right uh but if the federal reserve writes a check it's creating currency (laughs) like that's um it sounds like a pretty benign statement until you actually understand the mechanics of what's going on behind that and like what that means for average joe and the dollars in his pocket oh yeah yeah and that's a good word for it the biggest scam ever um, oh yeah, oh yeah. You know, honestly, let's go on a tangent here because when you said the biggest, you know, the greatest scam of all time, I immediately thought of the uh, most dangerous superstition of all time. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Which is a, a little bit of a sidebar, but I know you've mentioned Lark and Rose a couple times. Yeah. Uh, I obviously uh, I follow him as well. I'm very impressed by by what he puts out. So yeah. Uh, for those of you listening who have not heard of Lark and Rose, that's L A R K E N. Uh, Larkin Rose wrote a book called The Most Dangerous Superstition, and uh, it's basically the myth and the belief of authority. And uh, Danilo, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with it, so hash that out a little bit more. And when did you just (laughs) Larkin? Yeah, yeah. I I I think I first heard about him through his YouTube channel, and I saw a bunch of his videos. Really awesome, awesome videos. Um, You know, awesome way he presents things. Very clearly understood. uh, You know, clear to understand for for everybody. And then, um, and then he wrote this book, and uh, and this book, yeah, I mean, it, it 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 like really focuses on the belief in authority and how it's illegitimate, and and he just uh, that's, that's really the main focus of the book, um, and he goes, you know, he describes that in different ways, but um, I think it's very well written. He talks about the Milgram experiments, Stanley Milgram experiments, um, um, which is uh, you know, the uh, the the when they used electrocution. It's like they used, uh, you know, people from the street, and they and they basically told them to, you know, to, you're going to test this person, and if they get it wrong, then you're going to deliver an electric shock, and then they increase the electric shock as they get more and more 
uh, wrong answers. But of course, the test subject is a fake, right? But they don't know that. They think it's real. Yep. And then eventually the, fa- the, the test subject stops responding, stops like saying like, you know, um, you know, exclaiming that, that they're in pain. But then they, they turn to the authority, the, the, the man, the white coat, and the guy says, please continue. And so they do. So, so it just illustrates the belief in authority. If there's an authority figure that is willing to take the blame, then people can do really horrific things. Even everyday decent moral people, you know, they consider themselves more, but if they if they have this belief in authority, it's sad. Oh my God, it's really tragic. <laughs> you know, I feel like the uh, best summation uh, of what I've learned from Larkin Rose, he's got a, a quote that I'll paraphrase. It says, you know, I'm not afraid of the Hitlers and the Maos and the Stalins. I'm afraid of the thousands upon thousands of people that you know, believe them into power that, you know, are willing to follow these directives mm. from some crazy guy, you know, with a mustache. It's, um, and that's really, uh, yeah. an accurate statement. I mean, that, that's really what it is. And we say these things like, Oh, somebody was a good law abiding citizen. And it's like, well, what does that really mean? You know, it's become so commonplace that, uh, we don't really think about what that means. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, Larkin has been really illuminating for me anyway to uh, figure that out and um, just discuss this this myth and authority. So, <laughs> Oh, he's awesome. Yeah, yeah, he's really great uh, to, to show people. Like I send, I, I use his video, If You Were King, very often to people. I haven't uh, seen that. Oh, it's an awesome one about basically uh, describing why um, there can be no such thing as a benevolent ruler that can do no uh-huh. wrong. You this know. sounds interesting. I'll have to Google that. <laughs> oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, basically that you know, even if like like you know, let's say let's say a ruler's in power and he says, "All right, I'm going to force everybody by law to eat their vegetables," <laughs> you know, and then he's like, "Well, what if some guy doesn't want to eat their vegetables? What are you going to do? <laughs> You're going to beat yeah. him? You're going to cage him? You know, what are you going to do? You're going to get your enforcers? You know, doesn't matter what it is. It could be the nicest thing. You know, it's always backed by force." You know, forcing yeah. people to do exercise because exercise is healthy, you know. <laughs> and, and then even he's like, and, and then after all that, he's like, now, and eventually the ruler realizes, okay, anything I do is backed by force. He's like, so I'm not going to do anything. So he retreats into his castle, but then he realizes what? But even just living there, he's surviving on taxes, which is itself a form of violation of consent and violence. So, <laughs> so therefore, there can never be any benevolent or philosopher king, as Plato would say. Um sure. You know, there's no such thing that that the idea of a ruler is inherently immoral and unjust. Yeah, and that's uh, that's what anarchy really means. <laughs> yeah, it's not the uh, or that's one of them anyway. That's not the uh, the typical picture people have when they hear this word anarchy or anarchist. And so along those lines, uh, you and I have discussed this before, but we both like to use the A word. And uh, <laughs> to you, how would you define it? Yeah, yeah. So when I when I um well, usually I don't bring that word up the first, you know, immediately because it does like uh um scare some people. Um but I I usually go through the back door, ask questions, you know, ask them about, you know, um their, basically their morality and things like that. And then eventually like, "Wait a minute. Are you some kind of anarchist or something?" <laughs> or or if I or if I advocate for like, I'm like, I don't think you should pay taxes. I mean, I, I think you should avoid taxes at all costs. And like, but how how is the government supposed to run? Exactly, you got <laughs> it right. <laughs> yeah. And and so so basically, what I say is because, and then eventually when they stumble upon the idea of anarchy, that's what I'm talking about. They're like, well, of course, they their mind goes off in these little tangents and speculations. You know, you know who's going to build the roads and feed the poor and you know how's the homeless and you know you know take care of the elderly and the sick and all that kind of stuff. And um, and I'm like, all right, forget about all that. All right, you can just get lost in those rabbit holes and those confusions. It's not a fruitful conversation. So the way I say is. Just I'm just talking to you, okay? Forget about everybody else. I'm just talking to you. Do you have a conscience? Do you have morality? Do you understand what morality is? You know, would you do something immoral if somebody told you to do so? Mm-hmm. You know? And if not, then that's great. <laughs> that's it. That's all I'm saying. Live live 
and be responsible for the consequences of your actions. That's it. That's all. That's all I advocate for people to do. You know, I, and I like you know my message. I try to simplify as much as possible because I think it's uh, it's you know too e- too easy to get complicated and and I think that's that's counterproductive. You know, people get lost in the complications, and uh, the more we simplify our message, the more it's um, understood by people who are trying to you know grasp it. Sure. So on that note, I want to talk a little bit, about, a little bit about the non-aggression principle because that's that's really what changed my life. Stumbling across it, and I know you're running a peaceful parenting, and uh, the non-aggression principle plays into that. So for our listeners, could you please define the nine or non-aggression principle, and then tell me some of the projects you've been doing that, or how basically you've incorporated it into your life. Yeah, so uh, I mean, before I met Dave Painter from the Seize Liberty podcast, I, I, I used to refer to that as the, um, you know, like uh, like the golden rule, you know, treat others mm-hmm. as you would want to be treated. But then Dave's like, no, that's actually not good, right? Because what it's if the silver rule? What if? <laughs> yeah, right. You're <laughs> like, what if you're a masochist, right? And you enjoy <laughs> being beaten and tortured and enslaved? Yeah. All right, that's all right. You're right. All right, maybe <laughs> don't treat others the way you don't want to be treated. Maybe that's better. Yeah. It's gotta be. It's gotta be a nitpicker, you know. Um, but 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 for the most part, I think most people maybe are, I would assume are not masochists. Yeah. <laughs> and so and so basically, another way I like to describe it is um, uh, just you know I guess I guess volunteers in general is having uh, voluntary consensual interactions between peaceful people. Right. That's what anarchy is. Right. It's not some crazy. Um, nightmare from a movie that was Hollywood made to try to, you know. <laughs> Everybody's wearing sweatshirts and carrying crowbars. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 I mean, I mean, that is um, that's more chaos as a result of a, of a you know immediate collapse sure. of the state, perhaps. But anarchy itself is is all around us, right? You know, when you yeah. choose to hang out with people that you enjoy your, their company, that's anarchy. When you choose to have a family with somebody, nobody told you to do that. When you when you when you <laughs> when you select a, a profession, nobody told you to do that. What time you want to wake up? What do you want to eat for breakfast? What do you want to wear today? That's anarchy. It's it's nothing like uh, it's nothing spectacular. <laughs> So that's yeah. uh, I mean that's an easy way of putting it too. Yeah, <laughs> I I like the word volunteerism as well, and I think you kind of hit the nail on the head. It's you know it's voluntary consensual mm. interaction between peaceful people, and I think that pretty much covers all the bases. That um, one, it's not good to coerce people or infringe upon them, or certainly not to aggress against them, but. Um, the voluntary part is like, well, what do you want for breakfast? <laughs> like you said, <laughs> being aware. Like everybody is a uh, is going to make um, different choices that way. So right, um, yeah, it just made a lot of sense to me when I first came across it. But um, and, it, and it's, I, so, yeah. it's so self evident. It's like it's like why didn't I think of this before? <laughs> like how could I have thought any other way? You know, and, yeah. And it's so simple. And that's what I love about it, the simplicity of it. Um, yeah. and, and of course, the state is is the one giant eight hundred pound hairy gorilla in the room that doesn't adhere to <laughs> that principle. But everybody's everybody's like, but that's different. That it doesn't apply to that gorilla. Every it applies to us, but not the gorilla. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's different, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So that's also well, <laughs> from that um, and like taking one step, like further on the spectrum or I guess closer to what most I guess what we're discussing is really like what is the most proper most moral way for people to live with each other like what sort of governance if any is the one that allows people the most freedom you know the most opportunity to flourish and whatnot and you know I think you and I would agree that like volunteerism is probably the answer I haven't come across anything better yet that uh, has convinced me, but one thing that's pretty compelling for a lot of people is this idea of minarchism. And hmm. um, I hope I'm saying that right. <laughs> yeah. This is essentially when people say, hey, you know, we need to have some sort of governance, but it needs to be limited. And a lot of times it's called, you know, the night watchman state. You know, we'll have a small government. Its only roles are, you know, defense of the people and, um, you know, the military and the courts most often are, are what a lot of people kind of fall into that camp. Um, would you rebut minarchism? And if so, how and why? Um, and I'm saying that word right, or is it minarchy? No, 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 the minarchism. Yeah, I think that's how you say it. Um, 
So, I mean, the first thing I'll probably say is, you know, the United States, you know, was the experiment of the smallest um, minarchist state yeah. in history, and it has grown to be the largest, uh, you know, Leviathan military <laughs> industrial complex, you know, uh, that's been terrorizing the entire planet. <laughs> so I, it's, I would safely say it failed. Um, but uh, you but, remind me of uh, the Lysander Spooner quote. He says, "You know, the Constitution, whether it, uh, oh shoot, how does it go?" He's saying like, uh, "It's not fit to exist because it has created the government we now have, or has failed to prevent it." Right, and that's what you just reminded me of. It's like we started small with this great little document. It was an awesome effort, but look what it's turned into over the course of two hundred fifty years. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think uh, some minarchists, you know, if you would say that, they would say, well, because, uh, you, you know, you'd say, well, you see, your constitution failed, you see, and then they'll be like, well, of course, it's just a piece of paper. You know, it's us. <laughs> it's up to us to defend the piece of paper. And I'm like, I'm like, why are you defending a piece of paper? Just live for yourselves. Forget about the piece of paper. It's not important. OK, <laughs> you don't need a piece of paper to tell you what your rights are. OK, everybody, yeah. everybody has natural rights that a piece of paper or or politicians or state officials <laughs> you know didn't have to grant them <laughs> yeah because i forget who said it uh uh maybe voltaire he's like uh you know the, the the state if a state is powerful enough to give you your rights it's also powerful enough to take away your rights yep. right um, yeah and and so i think that's uh you know that, that that's one thing and the other thing is um philosophically understanding you know what is government right because this is the other thing when i talk to people is make the distinction be between government and and business private enterprise you know there's a big difference but everybody blends the two because you know because right. they consider like a government job as a job a regular job and i'm like no it's a big difference yeah. <laughs> i'm like one the private enterprise job that's created out of demand right and it's sure. creative out of voluntary exchange and if it's no longer needed it's destroy. I mean, sure. it just vanishes, right? It, it, you can't keep it keep it alive with guns, right? You, or mm -hmm. coercion or violence. Whereas the, the government job, and, and and the government job is created out of force, right? And co and coercion and violence, and it, there's no demand whatsoever. It actually creates its own artificial demand, right? Through taxation with the violence and everything. But um, but yeah, it's 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 um. It's a big difference, right? And I, and I and I have to. I think we always have to distinguish that. Like like also another common false dichotomy is is people blend um, civilization with the state, <clears throat> right? Yeah. They're like, look at everything that we have, all these wonderful cities, you know, all this technology. Look at this phone. Look at this laptop. We can talk. That's all because of the government. That's the state. <laughs> How can you hate the state? Look at everything that we have. <laughs> and I'm like, no, 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 no. You got it all wrong. The productive people are the host. They're like the people who are actually working, creating, innovating, and trading freely, peacefully. Right? Those. Are, that's the. That's the. That's the host, and the state is the parasite. It's the leech that fastens itself onto the host, slowly uh, withdrawing and sucking away the life energy <laughs> and life force out of the host. Right. And and if the if the, if the parasite gets too large, the host dies, and then you know there's no more sure. state, right? So so people already always you know there's there's one um, uh, I remember one person asked the question like what what came first, the state or you know the civilization, right? The productive people, and you can't have you can't have the host before the parasite. <laughs> you see the host yeah. first, and the parasite finds the host, right? Yep. So so yeah. You are. Uh Reminded me too, I want to go back to this distinction between governments and business too, because I think it's an important one. And, um, you know, me working for a government paycheck for almost 15 years. Uh, <laughs> thank you, by the way. Um, you see the difference in like a business has an incentive to make a profit to provide a good or service that is actually usable and there are restraints and checks and balances on that system where when you have a government system like you said they create artificial demand um, they basically got a captive income force mm -hmm. or um, income oh, yeah. source sorry mm, yeah and it's just that um, that quote I just saw the other day the I think it was Bob Higgs says the 
I know it was Oscar Wilde. <laughs> um, the bureaucracy is expanding to meet the needs of an expanding bureaucracy. And it's like <laughs> that's exactly what government is. Like that's exactly what it's doing. Like it's not providing useful goods or useful services. There's no incentive to provide a good product. There's no customer feedback. They're not going out of business. You know, the post service has been held afloat for mm -hmm. I don't know how long, but. Right. <laughs> I mean, that's just such an important distinction. I think people know and they, you know, we've got the phrase, oh, it's good enough for government work. I mean, so there's this idea out there that it's it's inefficient and it's wasteful and it's ineffective. But that's as far as most people take it. Like, I don't think they really draw the distinction then between like, why, why are business and government different? And why is one like a net positive <laughs> as opposed to the other? Yeah, and, and, and the other thing I think, uh, if, if people confuse those two things, I'd like to ask them is, have you ever owned a business? <laughs> do you know anybody that owns a business? <laughs> because sure. if you do, then you understand how difficult it is to create a business, create value, uh, you know, products and services that people want to buy, and you put all that yep. you know, capital and sweat and effort and then you know the the government comes in, the state comes in, and you know steals forty percent or fifty percent. Um, and there's one there's one quote by Erwin Schiff, which is um, every entrepreneur has an unwilling partner that uh, yeah. that uh, <laughs> it's like it's like contributes no work, contributes no no money, uh, yeah. and, and then claims claims to 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 own like forty percent or fifty percent of the profits. <laughs> Worst business partner in the world, Uncle Sam. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so. So yeah, I, th I think it's it's so important um, <clears throat> for us to emphasize, um, you know, the illegitimacy and the immorality of the state, right? Because it's not only like you said, you know, you said if it's good, you know, it's good enough for government. Like, it, it, so I guess some people recognize that it's ineffective, but it's not only ineffective; it's immoral and it's unjust. Sure. And the only, you know, the greatest atrocities in history have happened, you know, in the name of the state. Right. You know, it, like uh, well, another thing that Larkin Rose says really well uh, is that, um, you know, the people that have committed the greatest atrocities were not individuals, not individual murderers or psychopaths or rapists. Mm -hmm. They were people acting in the name of the state, just doing their job. Right. Yeah. Just following orders. Right. Uh, it's a terrifying thing. And, you know, when you discuss philosophy with people like they put all these burdens on, you know, anarchism or whatever. And, oh, how's it going to prevent this or it's going to be mayhem. And uh, Robert Higgs says, you know, any mayhem that's the result of an anarchistic society is like purely conjectural. Yeah. But the mayhem like that results from a status society is already known. Right. Like it's, we already know how bad it can be. We've already, there's been a Mao, there's been a Stalin, there's been a Hitler, there's been um, countless other examples of state sponsored violence that um, yeah. it's, it's a broken system. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, sometimes it's nice to actually name all of them. Like, you know, um, apartheid was, yep. uh, was part of the state, uh, chain slavery part of the, you know, sanctioned by the state, sure. uh, you know, all the world wars, mass murdering, Enterprises part of the state, you know the, sure. the, the all the democides and all the communist countries that you hear in the 20th century part of the state. <laughs> like, like Atomic just, bombs go down the list. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, genocide of the Native Americans part of the you know as a function of the state. Um, I mean, genocide of the Aboriginals in Australia part of the state. <laughs> you know, yeah. so I mean, the list goes on and on, and it's just amazing how how deep. Um, the uh, the only word to say it is indoctrination, right? Because you you really have to be indoctrinated uh, in order to overlook these massive crimes of history, you know, mm -hmm. crimes against humanity, um, and just shrug them off and say like, well, they did socialism wrong, but you know we're gonna do it better with Bernie Sanders, <laughs> you know. I Oh, that's um. So that's an interesting turn, you know, with Venezuela in the position that it's in right now, and from a lot of the Bernie people not really understanding what they're advocating for. And I think Bernie's a little unique. Like he actually seems like an honest, if highly misguided man. <laughs> um, I think there's just this this big lack of understanding on on his part and his supporters' parts. Unfortunately, uh, that's just really appealing to people. You know, I, I don't really um, try to figure out if a politician is being sincere or insincere. Mm -hmm. 
um, because in the end, it really doesn't matter because yeah. it's like it's like regardless, you know, there will be there will be damage done. You yeah. know, whoever, whichever puppet is in power, there will be damage right. done, you know, regardless if it's with good intentions. Um, yep. And uh, I mean, I, I mean, I'm inclined to believe that things happen regardless of who the puppet is in power. <laughs> things just <laughs> things just go along. The train will keep going. You know, oh, I mean, dude, people's memories are like four years long, like every four years. I'm like, oh, this is the one that's going to change it all. <laughs> it's like you say that every four years. <laughs> This time, <laughs> yeah. yeah. This time it's for real. So, <laughs> right, right. Also, go, go ahead, yeah. question: Do you vote? Oh, the last time I voted was 2008, um, which was for Obama. And the only reason I voted for Obama again was because my mother is a Democrat, and she's like, you know, and I didn't really care about voting. I'm like, I'm like, uh, she's like, you gonna vote? I'm like, yeah. She's like, vote. Who should I vote for? Obama. All right, I vote for Obama. <laughs> so I didn't really care. Uh, but after that, uh, learning more about it and learning the you know, I, I wrote an article called um, "Voting Is Violence," and um, oh, and, cool! I'll have to look that up. Yeah, it's on um, it's on the Daily Anarchist. Uh, I, I wrote a couple of articles for them, um, sure. but um, but yeah, so so I, I came to that conclusion that um, you know, y using the political process um, to impose your will upon your neighbor mm -hmm. is really a pretty nasty thing. You know, it's a pretty immoral thing to do. You know, you wouldn't like you wouldn't violently subjugate your neighbor for whatever reason, but you it's it's acceptable to use a political process to attempt to do that. Now, True. now whether or not that's effective or not, I don't know. I tend to think it's ineffective, <laughs> but just yeah. the intention of even if it is effective, it's still immoral. <laughs> yep. So there's multiple reasons why why I don't vote. Um, apart from the fact that I think I can I can do a much better job at improving the world by just staying home on that day and playing, uh, you know, connect four with my kids. I think that will that <laughs> yeah. will produce more good in the world <laughs> so yeah <laughs> so, so voting no and, and you know what's funny um i i meet up with a lot of um of homeschooling families um and uh and a lot of them are kind of inclined to hearing these conversations because they're already uh questioning the uh, education system right and so, yep. and so you gotta I'm, I'm like i'm like if the government can't do education right what do you think about everything else? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. so, you know, slowly I... What about health care? Like, right, what right. What about your policy? What about your privacy? <laughs> right, everything else. And uh, and so, yeah, they, uh, I think a lot of them are kind of open to it. Um, but but also I've noticed that a lot of um, homeschoolers, or that I've met anyway, are Bernie Sanders supporters, which is quite interesting. Really? That is interesting. I wouldn't have guessed that. But. I know. I know. Me neither. Um, so, and I mean, and they like, like, you know, they like farmers markets and stuff. And so, yeah, I guess I don't know. But yeah, so <laughs> I'm not a Bernie supporter, right? Yeah, no, no, I know, I know, but I'm just saying, I don't know what it is about. I mean, I mean, I don't know the hippie. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I have a feeling like all the Bernie supporters like right now feel the way that like Ron Paul supporters did for a long time. Like, hey, we've got a guy. He's got it figured out. It's like an enlightened view and mm. he's going to be the one to shake up the system. And then, you know, they're going to feel mass disappointment when, you know, he gets headed out of the, the race or, um, you know, nothing comes of it. And although... I must say uh, I'm much a much bigger fan of Ron Paul's ideas than than Bernie Sanders. I'm, I've got like three Ron Paul Revolution stickers on my truck, but <laughs> <laughs> <Nice>. um, <laughs> you know, I just I think there's this idea out there that like he's the the guy that's going to change it, and I, I don't think people advocating for him understand understand what those changes are or what they mean. Yeah, so. of course not. I mean, they don't. Yeah, when you say what is social, yeah, that's that's the other thing. When you're talking to people, it's it's a very good idea to establish basic definitions, right? Because if you don't understand, yeah. if they, the person you're talking to doesn't understand basic definitions, you're like you're like talking on a different planet, <laughs> different that's dimension true. with these people. Um, you know, you know, you're saying government is violence, monopoly on force, and and you know, taxation is theft, and, and they're like, no, it's a community. You know, you got to pay your fair share. It's civic yeah. civic duty. I'm like, did you even did you even hear what I just yeah. said? <laughs> no. You're like, oh, you know, look at Venezuela right now. It's like, ah, that wasn't true democratic socialism, <laughs> you know? If Bernie, Sanders, like, if Bernie Sanders was down there, he would have turned that place around in no time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, uh, 
This is an interesting time that we live in, although I imagine the world's probably always been this way, and uh, I'm just awake enough now to, to notice it. <laughs> well, and, and the other thing is it's so beautiful with the internet that we can have these conversations, do these podcasts, and have a blog, yeah. and just... And, and and that's what that's what gives me immense hope for the future is the rapid spread of information, right? Yep. I think that's what really um, will bring about um, a great a great improvement in the um, in the status of the human race because sure. one thing that bad ideas um, the one thing that that kills bad ideas quickly is exposure. Exposure to people, <laughs> exposure to sunlight. Just disseminate the bad ideas. Don't try to censor them. Don't try to repress them because you know you're just gonna get with met with more resistance. It's gonna be violence and everything. Just let them. Just just go out in the open. You know, socialism is great. Okay, now let's debate. <laughs> 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 write a book. Write a book on it. Let, let's see how that goes. You know. Yeah. So I think I think with this rapid spread of information, you know, borders are breaking down. Nationalism is breaking down. How can you? <laughs> How can you salute? How can you hate people in you know in the Middle East that we're told to hate by CBS, NBC, Fox, you know MSNBC? Um, when you can like Skype them, when you can chat with them through Facebook, you know you can't you can't hate these people because yeah. you know you know you just talk to them. You're like, do you guys want to come over here and bomb us? And they're like, yeah. they're like, no, I just want to go to work and raise my kids. <laughs> And yeah. feed them and give them a good education and tell them, be good and don't hurt people. That's what I want yep. to do. I know. Like, people around the world are uh, remarkably similar. And it's, uh, I think you're right. The internet's going to be good for, for closing those gaps. And mm. um, that was a really good segue, actually. I want to ask you about some of the projects you're working on. Throw them out there so uh, anybody listening can, can kind of look up some of the podcasts and blogs that you're running. Because I know you're involved in quite a few. Yeah, I um yeah, I started out with mine peacefulanarchism dot com, uh, and uh, I started writing for it, and then I started making videos for the Voluntary Virtues Network, which were just um uh, you know just me talking, and then mm -hmm. uh, and then they became interview style, which is really awesome, and now that's all I do. Um, sure. And um, and so yeah, that's been that's been pretty awesome, and and I've been like, whew, I mean, there's there's it's amazing how many people I've met doing this. It's so fun. Uh, because I would have had no reason to talk to these people if I didn't have a podcast, you know. So it's a really okay. awesome thing having a podcast. Um, and uh, and then eventually Dave and uh, Dave Painter and Jeremy Hengeller uh, contacted me from Facebook, and they're like, "Let's start a podcast, another one." So we started Seize Liberty podcast. Uh, that was like a year ago, maybe like April, so around there. And um, and that's been pretty awesome, and they've grown the page really well. Um, and, and I also post videos on the Conscious Resistance. Uh, Facebook page and YouTube channel. Yep. So, um, so yeah, so I'm on those. Um, and then I'm also trying to start a podcast with um, another woman, Melissa Rakovich, um, mm -hmm. uh, from Facebook. I uh, call the Peaceful Parenting. Uh, wait, uh, the uh, what was it called? The Non-Aggressive Parenting Podcast. So the NAP, <laughs> not Non-Aggressive Parenting Podcast. Yeah. That's <laughs> yeah. So, um, so but we haven't started yet, um, but we want to because uh, I think. I think just the the area of peaceful parenting and unschooling and homeschooling, there's so much um, content there to talk about that I think it deserves its own podcast. You know? Sure. And yep. Because I, you know, uh, people have questions like, "How do you do this unschooling? What do I yeah. do? Where do I learn more? Who's doing it? What's a typical day? <laughs> what kind of curriculum yeah. do you use? You know, all these yeah. kind of questions, right? And, yeah. And you, and you have um, you have uh, two kids or one kid. We have two, two, kids, two and a half and a seven month old. So, right, right. So, so I assume you get these questions as well, right? You know, yes and no. Like, not so much on the unschooling part because I think people have this idea in their head that like kids don't start schooling until uh, they're like five. Right. But um, you know, we're trying to. Gosh, I mean, it's just amazing. Like every interaction with my daughter is framed like through this lens of non-aggression and that surprised me and I'm really glad I learned about it before I became a parent because I think that's massively changed the way I interact with my kids and I think that's going to have a big difference on on who they grow up to be as as adults and um so yeah I mean I have a ton of questions I think one of the most influential people on my path towards volunteerism was uh, the libertarian homeschooler she's a, a friend of mine Anna and uh I started following her page like four years ago and 
she just she opened my eyes to an entirely different way of of treating your children that's that's just different than the traditional story. So I agree. There's a ton of material there you can work with. <laughs> so, um, so Jessica, you're saying that when your when your daughter cries, that she's not trying to deceive you and manipulate you into <laughs> into a. <laughs> I mean, it's, sometimes she is, but then we, <laughs> we have to figure out like, okay, why are you manipulating me? Like, <laughs> are you actually hungry, or is this a stalling tactic? Um, <laughs> wait, 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 hold on. I'm, I'm talking about your your infant. Oh, my infant. Oh, yeah, 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 that's yeah, that's what I'm referring to. <laughs> I know, that's so silly to me. Like, as I'm referring to, yeah. Well, no, that cracks me up because, you know, if one is crying versus the other, I know that one actually has, like, a legitimate need that I should attend to right now. Right, so it's right. like, okay, like, she's hungry, she's tired, she needs a diaper, yeah, or right, right, right. baby needs to be held. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah, you know, it's, oh, boy, we never, uh, these oh. people that say, uh, like, leave your kid and mm -hmm. ignore them and whatnot. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. There's a... Uh, like you said, a whole bunch of material you could unpack there, and I'm still learning as I go. But you know, it's working out all right so far. <laughs> yeah, that's what I like to tell people. Also, is that um, you know, I don't have all the answers, and I don't claim to have all the answers. But I, what I strive to do is live in a principal uh, way. Yep. I, I tried to find moral, uh, you know, moral stance that is consistent and logical, and. Um, and you know, I try not to be a <laughs> hypocritical, and yep. so and so every situation is different. Every child is different. Every family is different. Every parent is different, right? So mm -hmm. so I I don't tell people what to do. I don't tell people how to live their lives. I don't tell people how to raise their kids, right? I just give them principles, right? And mm -hmm. you apply those principles to your own life, and you yeah. you make the decision when to apply them and when not to apply them, right? I think too sure. many parents are looking for this book, a manual of parenting. If your daughter wakes up at 4.30 in the morning, what do I do? Okay, turn to page 34. The answer is on no. page 34. <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think a lot of mothers would, would kill for that, for that book, but, but I'm yeah. sorry. It doesn't exist. It, it's hard. It's like the hardest job in the world because it matters so much. I mean, the stakes are so high and what could be more important? Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I mean, we are creating – the future when you're raising kids you're creating the future right because these these kids will be the 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 world of tomorrow so you know the way i describe this to people is treat your kids the way you want to see the world you know oh, that's that's nice i like that because that's they will populate the world of tomorrow right so you know you want to raise people who use violence to solve their problems then use violence to solve your problem, you know? But if you want yeah. to raise kids to use reason and have patience and gentleness and kindness and compassion, then you yeah. exhibit that and your kids yeah. will model that. And, uh, you know, and that's, that's the best way to spread good ideas is by, um, you know, being the example, modeling, modeling yeah. yourself, right? You want to spread love? Living them out. Absolutely. Right. right. So. Well, uh, Danilo, we're, we're pretty close to, uh, I think I can hear the seven month old crying in the background. Oh, oh so all right. Got to get back to your peaceful parenting. you giving me into milk. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, but thank you so much for uh, taking the time today. Uh, we'll have this posted in a couple days. So um, for anybody listening, I want to give a shout out to Danilo's uh, work online. Again, peacefulanarchism.com and the Seeds of Liberty podcast, and we'll be looking forward to your NAP for a uh, parenting blog. And uh, thanks so much for, for talking with us and branching out into this topic on, on our otherwise conscientious objector podcast. Awesome, Jessica. I really, really enjoyed uh, talking with you again. Thanks, thanks like a lot. Her. Thank you, Danilo. Take care. Cell 411 is a free app for Android and iOS that replaces government controlled 911. Cell 411 allows you to preset a group of friends or private organizations to show up in any emergency. Cell 411 is a nightmare for the state because it proves their so called services aren't needed. Cell 411 has had thousands of installs, and of course, it's covered by the Bipcot No Government License. Cell 411 because your friends won't shoot you when you're in trouble. Without the government, who would build the emergency services? You and Cell 411. Get it today at GetCell411.com. That's GetCell411.com.